If you can't keep 10 guys off of you in a prison shower, then you don't need another carbine course. You need some jujitsu in your life. You need some Muay Thai in your life, you know? And you need this kind of training, and that's what we do in the MDOC. Do you want to demo those at a quicker speed or not? You know, I'm glad you asked that. I think that's a great idea. <laughs> So I started in law enforcement uh, a little over 20 years ago, in 1998, and uh, it was kind of a family business, so to speak. Uh, my grandfather was a sheriff, my great uncles were sheriffs, my cousins were deputies and officers and departments, and so I didn't go into law enforcement until later on in life, until um, I was almost 30. Um, but once I got in, I kind of knew this is where I belonged, like I felt like home. And while I was there, I was able to do undercover work. I was able to work as a member of the SWAT team, as a resident officer, which means I live in an at-risk neighborhood, and try to bring all the energies and the uh, agencies of the city to help, you know, kind of liaison role to help improve that neighborhood, make it better, uh, work with people in the neighborhood as well. So that was really important in my development as an officer and as a person. Um, and then from there, I came out of that and I became a neighborhood officer, which is kind of a, a lighter version of the resident officer. And then I spent uh, the rest of my career as a patrolman, as a patrol officer, and I was involved in training uh, as a range officer as well. I was one of the lead pistol instructors at my agency. And um, then I closed that out uh, this year, earlier this year. Um, I retired on Friday the 13th because I thought that's appropriate. And uh, so, made me happy. And then um, I focused entirely all my energy on my gym, which is the Straight Place Gym of Illinois. It's a martial arts and fitness facility. And focused all my energy now on helping people bring them their best self to the world. And I do that through Brazilian Jiu Jitsu and fitness and kickboxing and then also teaching the multidisciplinary optimization course to folks, as well as assisting the guys in ShivWorks teach their coursework as well. So around 2005, I went to Canada with Craig Douglas, the founder of the ShivWorks uh, training group, and we taught a course together. And it was my first time seeing his coursework and my coursework kind of side by side, and we taught like a co course. I don't know what else you would call it. You know, both of us teaching for half of the day and for both days. And it was really eye-opening and educational for me. Craig is a master instructor. And at, up to that point, I had not worked with folks who weren't athletes. All of my exposure training people had been primarily straight blast gym and SWAT guys. And so I was used to, because I had begun working also at a place called The Site in 2001, so I was used to working with guys who kind of came to me as a finished product. Um, so working with people from ground zero up was a new thing. And Craig has that mastered because he had begun teaching um, at a police academy level. So recruits, people coming in off the street, um, fairly clueless, but ambitious and hungry and wanting to get after it. So. That was an eye-opener. I never considered that before. And so Craig and I, through the years, continued to teach together. I continued to assist him as often as possible. And then I began to teach coursework. Um, and as it went on, it began to get some momentum. So Craig and I sat down and Craig said, listen, we need to design this, um, put some sort of system in place so it's systematic. It's not just helter-skelter and um, you actually have an end goal in place. So you go through the two days and by the end of the second day, they leave better than they showed up. And I was like, right on, let's do it to it. So that became the multidisciplinary optimization course. And Craig actually came up with the term because he's a word guy and an acronym guy. <laughs> so he came up with all that and it was aimed at folks who came to his coursework the EWO, which is Edge Weapons Overview, 
and ECQC, which is Extreme Close Quarters Concepts. And folks would come to those courses and just get blown over by Hurricane Craig. He would just overload them with information, smoke them, and then they would leave. And so we were looking for something that would then fill the gaps. So people would come to my coursework and I would do what I'm best at, which is designing drills to isolate specific portions of the fight, of the information, and then we just do reps. And so folks would come to my course, they would do easily 100 reps of each drill through the course of the weekend, and they would leave much improved. And so that was kind of the genesis of it. Since that time, it's progressed, it's evolved, so to speak, um, with input from a lot of different people, um, all the guys in ShivWorks, guys in Straight Place Gym, guys outside, um, uh, Master Chief Jim Carver at the site, guys like that would just give me input um, out of the kindness of their heart. I don't know why they'd give me <laughs> Maybe they thought, man, this guy screwed up. Let me fix him. But, uh, but they would come and they would give me input, and it was awesome. And I would tweak the course and continue to try to bring the best possible product to the people that trust me with their time, which is most important, and with their money, and hopefully it never happens, but maybe with their life if they have to defend themselves in a real fight. And so that's where it's, the course has come from and that's where it's headed. I'm Paul Sharp, and I want to introduce you to the MDOC coursework. MDOC is an acronym. It stands for Multidisciplinary Optimization Course. Over the next two days, we want to teach you how to deal with everything from a harsh word to a hand grenade. Um, maybe figuratively on the hand grenade, but still, we want to do our best to prepare you for whatever it is you're going to run into. Now here's how we do it. We're going to put a lot of emphasis on what we call ADD. Now I'm not the one that came up with that. Andy Stanford did. Andy Stanford kind of codified it into avoidance, deterrence, and de-escalation, which is a perfect way to approach every conflict, whether it's somebody you know or somebody you don't know. We want to put the emphasis on winning fights by not being in that fight. Uh, again, that's something that Dr. William April says. So you're going to hear me refer to these guys because their teaching and their material heavily influence what I present to you guys. I look at myself as the conduit. I'm just passing on good info that I've been able to gather over the last 25, 30 years of intensively studying this material. Uh, one of the things that we're going to do the first day is we're going to work on initiative. So the first day, we take you through initiative. That means you hit first, you hit fast, and you hit last. You don't wait around. You know conflict is imminent, and you got to get it on. Day two, it's all from the deficit, meaning They've already made a move on you. You found yourself in a hole, and you got to dig your way out. It's not optimal, but it can be done. First things first, you got to have the mindset that says, I'm not going to be stopped. I can't be beat. I'm ready to get it on. And so we'll work on all that as we go through the next two days. Uh, as you work your way through this coursework, I'm going to refer a lot to mindset. It's the most important element. If you don't believe that you can survive this, you're not going to. Um, you talk to any EMT, you talk to any emergency room nurse or doc, and they'll tell you that if somebody comes in on the table and believes that they're going to make it, most of the time they will make it, uh, barring the removal of the head from the body. So there's even a few people that will tell you that unless the head is removed from the body of your opponent, you probably shouldn't turn your back on them if it's a lethal situation because dead people have been known to come back to life. The human body is a resilient thing. It's, it's, a, it's a mechanism, it's a machine that's hard to put down. Um, for those of you that are hunters, uh, you'll know that uh, it's pretty hard to put a deer down. It's pretty hard to put all kinds of things down. And people that have been in gunfights and uh, lethal force encounters will tell you it's hard to put a person down. So the other side of that is we want to tap into that. We want to access that, as, that part of ourselves, that survival instinct, and bring it out in the worst case scenario. Hopefully you never have to do it, but we want to prepare you for when you have to do it. And that's what we're going to cover in the next two days. We're going to cover empty hands. We're going to cover edge weapons, impact weapons, and firearms, as well as verbal strategies to de-escalate and deter before you ever even have to go there. The majority of our students that come through the course are just normal people. You know, and I know that, you know, the old saying normal is just a setting on your dryer. And, uh, but I don't like the word average either, because I think we're only as average as we realize at the moment. You know, we have some pretty amazing people walking around amongst us. They've just never been put in a situation to find out that they're amazing. And, um, but yeah, man, the most, 
the majority of the people that come through are normal folks. You know, I've had guys up to 72 years old and gals, you know, up in the late 60s, 70s come through. And then I've had people that are 18, 19 come through that don't have really anything except for they're going to college and they want to be ready for whatever their, their dad or mom wants them to attend the course and be better prepared for whatever might be out there. And so, yeah, you don't need to come to me, you know, being some sort of strongman competitor that's also a purple belt, that also has got multiple combat tours or all this stuff, you know, not that that's bad at, by any means, but it's not necessary, you know, to successfully complete the course and apply the material to your life. Helping us out today is Nick Potts. This is a good friend of mine. He's a blue belt here in uh, Brazilian Jiu Jitsu. He's fought MMA and he is a black belt in Judo on the Olympic circuit. And he's a stud, good dude to have helping us out here today. All right, so let's talk a little bit about hitting off the initiative. So what I wanna do is I've made the decision. I've told this guy to back up. I've given him commands. He's not listening. Again, going back to what we talked about before, no means no, right? So if I tell somebody no, they're not listening, they have bad intentions. There's no reason for me to continue to give them commands. They've already showed me they're not gonna listen. It's time to get it on. But within the Straight Blast Gym, we are combat athletes. And so everybody that we teach, everybody that we work with, knows how to throw a jab, knows how to throw a cross. The only difference that we make for self-defense or street situations would be that we open the hand a little bit and we do an eye jab. So basically what he's gonna do is it's almost like he's trying to grab a orange or a ball. So he's just trying to grab a handful of my face with that lead hand. So once he makes that decision, when I step, he's gonna grab a handful of that face, which is gonna open him up, and then we're gonna do what we do every day in the gym, which is throw a cross. So the second that comes out, then the cross comes in. Now this is done off of initiative. This means he's got his hands up, he's in a fence, he's telling me to stay back, I step in, and he initiates. We can't wait. So the decision has been made, our instincts are screaming, our gut's telling us that bad things are about to happen, it's time to go. So one more time, he's got his hands up, he's giving me commands, I'm not listening. Once I step into that range, he's wide open. The eye jab lands, and then the cross comes in. That ends the conversation, hopefully. At that point, there's a number of options we have the best option at that point would be to get out of there. Most guys aren't gonna be able to take a good hard hit off of a combat athlete, somebody that's training every day. Most folks, normal folks, aren't gonna be able to deal with that. And so that's why we put the emphasis on make that hit and then get going, okay? So one more time, hands are up. Now, this is important. He understands distance and spatial relationship because he's training every day. If you're not training every day, you need to start because that's the only way you're gonna understand when too close is too close, all right? So once I get here, he knows this is striking distance, he's ready, he throws the cross, and he skedaddles, and then that's it. Now, if something happens and I can't run, because remember, we talked about never taking two steps back, never stepping into an unknown space. If something were to have happened where Nick got manipulated into a corner before he decided to initiate, he can't run that way. He's got to run through me. We're going to do what we call a boxing blast. Now, Matt Thornton, head coach and president of the Straight Blast Gym, demonstrated this in the beginning, way back in the 90s. Is Matt that old? Yeah. Way back in the 90s, Matt did a video series where he showed the boxing blast, and that is money. So this is what's going to happen. So I'm stepping in. Nick decides it's time to go. He hits with the eye jab, hits with the cross, and then a succession of crosses follows. So he basically runs at me while throwing a cross after cross after cross. So again, I step in, spatial relationship, he understands I'm too close, this is dangerous. He launches with another cross, another cross, and another cross as he runs past me and away, maybe even over top of me. But the bottom line is that he's not trying to get into an exchange with me where we're trading shots and working. We've made the shift to how do we apply our sport tactics to a self-defense or street situation. And so in that arena, the objective is to get the heck out of there before things get worse. So he's landing those shots and getting out of there. All right, so he's going to run me over and get gone. I, I think the difference between my approach and a lot of the other approaches that you'll see out there is that I try to base it on where people really are 
rather than where they should be. Uh, William April, Dr. William April, likes to say the world isn't as we think it should be. It is as it is. And so you just have to deal with it. So if I have someone come to me and says, hey, you know, I have my carry permit. I have a pistol. Um, but due to my job, I'm a medical professional. Can't carry a weapon. I know self-defense guys that will tell them, well, you need to dress around the weapon. You need to make it work. And as one of my uh, members said to me one time, she's a nurse that works around an MRI all day. She's like, if I carried a gun in there, I'd be glued to the machine or the gun would be out of my waistband and glued to the machine and I'd lose my job. So when you have self-defense experts who want to say, dress around the gun or you should carry no matter what, despite rules and regulations, despite laws, you know, what they call a non-permissive environment, um, they tell people to carry anyway. I think they lack a little real world experience. I think they lack what it's like to actually have a job to, you know, these are usually people that have spent the bulk of their adult life on a range or in an environment where someone seeing them with a weapon didn't really matter. And so I think that the difference between myself and them is I've been in environments as an undercover where I couldn't be made. Like, I couldn't have somebody see a gun on me. I couldn't have somebody figure out that I was the police. Um, and I, I definitely could not be caught with a gun on me. And so walking into those environments, being able to handle myself, know that if I need to access something, I can, you know, but also knowing how to come out of that environment and bring that knowledge with me to apply that to how to train people. Say, you know, you have someone that works in a government building, they're not allowed to carry. Uh, medical professionals, how are you going to carry in scrubs? You know, all these different things that people, a lot of self-defense guys don't think about, I've had to think about and give good, solid information to those people about what they can do in that situation rather than leave them feeling like it's hopeless, I'm just a victim. Some of the things that usually happen and where this starts to fall apart is guys aren't throwing the cross off the opposite leg. So it is truly a cross each time. So when Nick steps and then he, he changes leads every time. So each time he throws, he's coming off the rear leg and it is actual a cross. Okay, so what will happen is guys will do this. They'll step and step. So that's not what we want to do. All right, because what's that? That is just jab, cross, jab, cross, jab, cross. It's not optimized for that environment, okay? Just like anything, we want to optimize our skill set for the environment we're in. So, in this situation, he wants to turn every shot into a cross. So he's driving me back with his whole body behind each shot. That's one of the first pieces I see where people start to kind of fall apart with this. The next thing is, what if they don't back up? That's cool. So he throws the cross, I don't go anywhere, or I bend. All he's going to do is just, he's just going to go past me. He's just going to get, yeah, that's it, problem solved. So if the guy doesn't move or the guy, like I said, most guys, listen, let's talk about the myth of the street fighter. Like, we're talking about a dude who just wants to make enough money, you know, kind of hit a lick. He just wants to get a little cash, something like that. He's not looking for a fight, okay? The other side of that is the guy in the bar, right? Male social dominance fights. Tell me the last time you saw a guy go into a bar and find the biggest dude. Like, that just doesn't happen. They look for somebody they think they can beat. So the second that you land a hard shot on that guy and you rock him, he's not interested anymore. Like, this isn't what he bargained for. This is not the deal he's looking for. So rarely will you see a situation where a guy takes that shot and just looks at you. You know, it's just not going to happen. So he's going to throw that shot. Guy buckles. He gets past me and gets out of there. So that's the next thing. So again, we're not looking to get tangled up with them. We're not looking to stand there and trade shots. I'm looking to throw my hits and get out of there. Once we initiate with the boxing blast, we're closing on this guy. If something were to happen, I need to get control of this person. Uh, there's another opponent. There's multiple opponents uh, in closed space. Or it might just be somebody that you know, I landed a couple good shots. I need to get control of him and then put him down in a corner against a wall or just maintain control of him until authorities get there or other people get involved that can help me get control of this guy. Here's what we're going to do. We're going to go to an underhook and a straight arm, which is going to control the head, going to control the upper body, make it really hard for him to access tools. Also makes it so I can see his body to make sure he doesn't have weapons. All right. So 
off of the blast. So we're going to blast in right there. He's going to get his underhook. He's going to put the other hand straight against the side of my head and push me down and off balance. What this is doing is making it so that I can't access tools and also it's allowing Nick to see my whole body so he can start to assess the level of threat here. So we always want to look at the whole body, the hands, and then the surrounding area, right? We already know their demeanor. Their demeanor is they're mad, they're pissed, whatever it is. But what I'm concerned about now is not just the hands, but the whole body. Does he have weapons on him? Also, does he have weapons nearby? So I want to shut down the possibility that he's going to access the tool and use it against me. Right there, he's going to get his underhook. He's going to put the other hand straight against the side of my head and push me down and off balance. Let's talk about options that we have once we get that tie. So once we make that attachment, we tie up with them. There's a couple things that we have uh, available to us. One is a knee. So Nick has the knee. When I'm here, he can drive off the rear leg and that's a good solid knee right there. Especially if he turns me a little bit and then runs me into that knee. This is something Bryce Frank calls creating collisions. And I think that's a great way to describe it. I never had a way to describe it before. That's probably the best way I've ever heard. So what we're doing is we're locked up in here and we're creating collisions because my face is moving this direction right into his knee. Rather than just hold me statically and throw the knee, this also gives him the opportunity to kind of look around, you know. He spins me, that gives him a chance to see what else is going on around him. So he doesn't just get locked into, it's me and this guy and we're duking it out, which is great if we're in a cage, we're in a ring. But in this environment, we need to keep that awareness going. The next thing is the elbow. So he's going to simply do an up elbow from right here. Same thing, he's going to kind of spin me a little bit and then drive that elbow up. This elbow is going to crack me right across the side of the head. So the second he pulls me in, boom, that collision happens right there. You can also throw a regular horizontal elbow, which is he's just going to drop it straight across right into the ear. That's going to sting a little bit too. It's all about creating those collisions though. Everything is based upon him spinning me into something. So if you also notice, he's not muscling me. You know, it's not that he couldn't. He's a strong guy and he's got years of judo and wrestling in his background, he could muscle me, but why should he when he can use leverage and timing? So what he's going to do is he just takes a step backwards with that rear leg, which causes me to get pulled, you know, into him, creates the momentum, and then I run into his elbow, I run into his knee. So we're here, he spins me into the knee, or he spins me into the elbow, all right, or a combination of both. Always go for the combo platter, it's better. A couple things we want to look at. So once we make that contact, so Nick's blasted in, he's got that attachment, he's locked up with this guy and he's trying to control, he's assessing the situation, figured out that A, there might be other people involved, so I need to ditch this guy so I can deal with them or get the heck out of Dodge. Or this is the only guy involved, so let me just dump this dude right here, maybe slap on a rear naked, put him out, or I'll just leave. So a couple things. So there's two things I like to use. So one is if they are trying to go underneath of me. So Nick has the underhook, he has control of my head. If I try to go under here, he's just gonna force me down. When he forces me down, he's just gonna roll me. Basically, he's just, we just call it spinning him out because it's easier, it's less terminology. So he's just gonna spin me underneath of him and then that gets him resolution, okay? So we're here, he's making his shots, he gets pummeled in, gets control, I go underneath and he just drives me out. Now he's free to get out of there. So that's our first answer or one of our answers because it's going to be based on whatever they do. The second thing we're going to do is kind of an old school judo thing. He's going to get an arm under and here. Now this is for that guy that's like, I'm not going to be pushed down, right? So this guy's going to try to power his way up. When that guy powers his way up, rather than continue to fight him, all he's going to do is just going to go with me. So he's going to step through, this hand controls here, he catches the leg and drives me into the ground. All right, so one more time, he has his attachment here, I power up, he goes with it and puts me into the ground. All right, and I got to tell you, there's nothing more satisfying than hitting somebody with the planet. So every chance you can, throw them. Would you agree? Agreed. Yeah. Throw them. Let the planet do the work for you.
force. <laughs> Does all kinds of crazy shit. That's what my intestines look like right now. <laughs> I'm like one of those cows that they gotta like go in and cut their side open. Yeah, sorry I had to stop that short, man. I felt like you were just getting into a rhythm. So. That's all right. <laughs> yeah, right? <laughs> like, oh, God. <laughs> like, <laughs> Vic, tomorrow, Vic's like, how you feeling? I'm in the hospital, asshole. <laughs> My intestines did get flipped upside down. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. I mean, since they removed my gallbladder, it's okay. Or they say the spleen's next. I don't know. When people were talking about the difference between what we do and what other self-defense people do regarding uh, kind of the BS meter and legitimacy. It gets a little murky because you have this kind of credential war. So you have this guy was in this unit and did this in this environment. And so therefore his opinion is more valid than anyone else's. And then you have this guy over here and you get into all this other stuff and, and what I look at is I, I look at their student base and I look at my student base. And so if I have someone coming to me that's a nurse or I have someone coming to me that's a mom, what applied for me as part of a SWAT team going into a house with 25 other guys or on a barricaded subject car or something like that with 25 other guys has little to no bearing on a mom of two walking her kids to the car in a Target parking lot at 11 at night or 10 at night or whatever it might be. Um, no bearing whatsoever. Um, she can't call for air support. She can't call for, you know, more units. Uh, she's on her own. And so when people fail to address those issues, they miss the, the very picture we're trying to paint. You know, they miss the very person we're trying to talk to, the person that needs it most. And so... When you're talking to these people, a lot of times what, I, what I'll hear from kind of these shysters is fear-based talk. You know, they talk about like the big bad boogeyman. They talk about these crazy crime scenarios that are unicorns, literally. They talk about things that aren't based in any kind of data. Um, you know, Dr. William April has talked many times about, you know, the world's not what we think it should be. It is what it is. You know, the world is as it is, and we need to address it as such. That doesn't mean we need to be fear-based. That means we need to be data-based, data-driven, and look at the data, adjust our lifestyle to fit the data, and then move forward from there. There will be anomalies. There will be situations that are so bizarre, so far out there, and we can prepare for those too. But in the context of a two-day course, our best bet is to prepare people for probabilities rather than possibilities while encouraging them to train in jiu-jitsu, in combat sports, and deepen their knowledge so that when possibilities do come up, it's easy to solve. But for right now, most people, their biggest problem is going to be the guy that confronts them in a parking lot over a parking space or the person who... Uh, is getting a little too close to their child or maybe taking pictures of their child without their knowledge for whatever purpose. That kind of thing happens. And so how do you address that? Those are the things that they should be worried about, not 15 guys in ninja masks, you know, coming through their door in the middle of the night, you know, some sort of crazy home evasion situation or whatever. They should be worried about reality. Reality is not what some self-defense people would have us believe it is. They, I don't know what fear-based model they're using, but reality is more of the everyday person that they have contact with, learn how to stand up to them, and also maybe the person at school who cuts in line with their child, like preparing their child to deal with that. Those are the type of things we focus on.